Hello everyone and welcome to the director's seminar at the Institute for Global Prosperity. I'm Professor Henrietta Moore and I'm the founder and director of the IGP. And it's wonderful to have you all with us. Welcome. Uh, we have a wonderful uh, speaker today and I'd like to introduce you to uh, Professor Peter Jackson. Uh, Professor Jackson is Professor of Human Geography at the University of Sheffield and co-director of the University of Sheffield Institute for Sustainable Food. Peter's research has been very uh, influential and wide ranging. Uh, much of it focuses on commodity culture and the geography of consumption with, of course, a particular interest in food. He chairs the interdisciplinary research uh, cluster at Sheffield on sustainable food uh, futures which aims to deliver resilient and sustainable agri-food systems to provide sufficient, safe, affordable, and nutritious food to all. Previous projects have included an ESC-funded project on consumption identity in North London, um, a project on commodity culture and South Asian transnationality funded through the ESRC's Transnational Communities Program, and culminating in an important book called Transnational Spaces. He's also done work on retail uh, competition and consumer choice on the study of food commodity chains. And in 2008, he completed a three year period as director of the Changing Families, Changing Food Research Program funded by the Levy Hume Trust. And he's gone on to do work on consumer an anxieties about food and on different, the whole issues of uh, international food markets um, and how that relates to the domestic scale and issues for individual families and households. Um, he's going to talk to us today about food systems for planetary prosperity and human health. So Peter, welcome to the IGP and can I offer you the floor, please? Thank you very much, Henrietta, for that uh, generous introduction. We were reminiscing before that um, I was at UCL as a lecturer uh, in the 1980s and left in 1993. I have very fond memories of the place and uh, it's good to be back, albeit in this sort of virtual fashion. Um, so thank you Henrietta for that and also can I thank in advance Joanne for uh, helping me with the slides today. Uh, so can we move to the first slide, my title slide, thank you. I saw my talk flash before me there. Uh, so thank you very much. So yes, my title today is Food Systems for Planetary Prosperity and Human Health. And my next slide um, apologizes slightly for the title and for my exaggerated love of planetary, of, 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 of um, alliteration. So could we have the next slide please, Joanne? Okay, so yes, my title uses the phrase human health and planetary prosperity. And in the past, I have committed numerous books with titles such as Maps of Meaning, Race and Racism, Anxious Appetites. So I'm afraid it's a bit of a, a habit I have, um, but hopefully both terms will be interesting for this audience. I think human health probably speaks for itself, although there are many ways of referring to public health, human health and so on. And in some ways, public health might be more accurate because of its emphasis on prevention of disease and improving quality of life. Um, I couldn't resist the alliteration of planetary prosperity. And I think this is similar in some ways to your institute's reference to global prosperity with its emphasis on flourishing and thriving, not just on material wealth. And I allow myself the indulgence of a bit of dictionary hopping uh, this morning. Uh, my favorite definition of prosperity was in something called the free dictionary which was about successful, flourishing and thriving. My next favorite was the Merriam-Webster, being successful, thriving, especially economic well-being. And my least favorite was the Cambridge Dictionary, which referred to having a lot of money. So I think um, uh, you're right. Uh, global prosperity is a really nice phrase around which to organize the work you're doing. And I share your interest in, in flourishing and thriving uh, beyond material wealth. I think I used planetary prosperity rather than global prosperity in this title though, because it chimes nicely with the idea of living within planetary limits. And many of you will know Rockstra Mattel's famous paper from 2009, 
in nature, uh, where he produced the diagram at the bottom of my slide on the right, which you don't need to read in detail, but it talks about the idea of a safe operating space for humanity. And now we've already exceeded that in those red wedges, which refer to climate, to biodiversity, and to the nitrogen cycle. And I think interestingly, uh, all three of those areas, which are in the kind of red alarm zone, are intimately connected with food. So food's a major, the food system is a major contributor to climate change. Uh, intensive farming is reducing biodiversity at an alarming rate. And the nitrogen cycle is clearly tied up with uh, fertilizers and other additives to the farming system. So, uh, as I say, a slight apology for all this alliteration, but I think it gets across much of what I want to do today. And part of it is about connecting things that often go unconnected. So lots of people work on food and health, and then another group of people work on food and sustainability. But myself and my colleagues in the Institute for Sustainable Food in Sheffield think there is real virtue, added value in bringing things together in what I'm going to talk about as, a, as a, uh, an agri-food system. So if we look at the next slide, uh, it just gives a quick outline of what I want to do in the next half hour or so. I think we need to define our terms, so I shall be talking about food security and sustainability, so I shall do that briefly and try not to do it in a sort of reductive way, that this is the, this is the answer, definition settled, but more in the Raymond Williams keywords tradition of showing all the different influences that come uh, uh, to be settle on these terms. I'm then going to talk about food and health and food and environment. But my key message, I think, really, is the need for food systems thinking, where we're integrative across food, health and environment, where we're inter or multidisciplinary and multi-sectoral. So we don't separate production, agriculture from health or from consumption. I'm going to say a few things about the roots of the current agri-food crisis and perhaps in the Q&A we can discuss to what extent it is a crisis. I'm then going to talk about a specific research project that I'm leading at the moment called H3, which stands for Healthy Soil, Healthy Food, Healthy People. My penultimate point is about the question of responsibility and where responsibility lies. Somewhat pretentiously I've called it the locus of responsibility. And my argument will be that there's an overemphasis on individual responsibility and consumer choice and not enough emphasis on wider systems, institutions and infrastructure. And then the conclusion will make a, a brief point about the, the advantages, the virtues, the benefits of connection. So next slide, please. I think most of you in the audience will be aware of what I call the kind of global or grand challenge around food security, or perhaps better food insecurity. But in case you don't, I'll just say briefly what the, what the challenge amounts to. By 2050, within a generation, in other words, the world's population will have grown significantly from 7.9 billion roughly now to around 10 billion. At the same time as the population's increasing, the agricultural land that's available to grow food for that population is decreasing, or at the very best, it's stable. It's probably decreasing though, because of the effects of urbanization that lead to land use change and to climate change. The, the challenge in, in short is to produce more food with fewer resources or less land. And that might involve changing consumption patterns. Sounds easy, but is remarkably resistant to change um, and to reduce food waste. We also need to address global inequalities in food related non communicable diseases, where the effects of obesity and overweight are particularly prevalent in the global north and chronic hunger and malnutrition are prevalent in the global south. But notice I say mainly in both cases, because you'll be aware that evidence of, of hunger and malnutrition even in prosperous places like the UK is significant and growing, I would say at quite alarming rates. And similarly, not all parts of the global south are immune to overweight and obesity. 
So those are sort of shorthands uh, to point out the notion, the nature of geographical inequalities in food related issues. Uh, next slide, please. As I say, I think we need to spend a moment on definitions uh, because they're not entirely straightforward. And this first definition of food security uh, in, invented in the 1990s by the World Food Summit, uh, but revised endlessly until this definition in 2009. And I sometimes spend time with my students going through all the clauses and subclauses in this definition and try to identify which lobby group or uh, political constituency might have argued for it. But this definition is expansive. Food security exists when all people at all times have physical, social and economic access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food to meet their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. And, and there's a, I edited a, a handbook of food research with Anne Murcott and Warren Belasco years ago. There's a whole chapter which takes you through the politics of how this definition arose, the various lobby groups and interests that are represented in it. So some of it is straightforward about access to food, but even access doesn't just mean physical access, it means social and economic access. It includes food safety, it includes culturally complex ideas about nutrition. It talks about needs, dietary needs, but then into a more slippery cultural realm of food preferences. And then it includes links between diet and uh, physical activity and, and healthy life. So the fact it's such a long definition, I think reveals something of the complexity of the topic. But if you wanted a shorter, snappier definition, look on the top right of the slide. And this is from the um, UKRI's Global Food Security Programme when they talked about sustainable, healthy food for all. So that's the capsule definition. But I think the longer definition is more interesting and more important because of the complexities it reveals. And then if we go on to sustainability, that makes food security look a very straightforward idea. Sustainability is highly complex, involves social, economic, environmental dimensions. But in this case, a, a high level panel of experts from the FAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization, talked about food systems being sustainable when they ensure food security and nutrition for all in such a way that the economic, social and environmental bases to generate food security and nutrition of future generations are not compromised. So it goes right back to Brundtland ideas about securing the well-being of the current generation without compromising future generations. We could spend a long time on these definitions. I think we, we've done enough for now to show that they're complex and, and contested ideas. So moving on to, uh, I, I think it's moving on to the next slide. I think it's fair to say that food security and sustainability have become, if you like, dominant discourses or dominant ways of framing the kinds of issues I'm going to talk about this evening. But there are many rival candidates for how to frame the question. And how we frame the question, I mentioned earlier Raymond Williams' keywords, how we frame the question really matters in terms of which constituencies get mobilized, whose voices are heard, how policy interventions are shaped. So we could make a case for talking about food poverty. Some people would say food vulnerability. And in this case, the Child Poverty Action Group talk about it being the inability to acquire or consume an adequate quality or sufficient quantity of food in socially acceptable ways, or the uncertainty that one will be able to do so. And I think this is a really interesting definition. It talks about quantity and quality. It talks about the idea of thing, food being socially acceptable or culturally appropriate. So think about kosher diets or halal diets and so on. It's not just about physical accessibility of food of any kind. And then it also refers to this idea, it's not simply, am I food secure today? But do, am, I, am I secure? Am I certain? Am I anxious about where food will come to, uh, come to me in the future? So that notion of uncertainty or anxiety and risk is I think part of this, this definition. And I mentioned just now that even in prosperous places like the UK, there is a lot of food insecurity, food vulnerability. 
So the Food Standards Agency just did a report which showed that one in six of their respondents in the UK were food insecure. And this morning there was further data from their tracker uh, survey. 22% of people in the survey reported skipping meals or cutting the size of their meals because they didn't have enough money to buy food. And if we think about the way in which uh, price of fuel, energy is likely to increase over the next few months, the kind of issues around eating or heating become highly significant for those who are poor, or in this case, living in food poverty. There will be food poverty and fuel poverty, and they're often in a very vicious trade-off between the one and the other. So we've got security, we've got sustainability, we've got poverty or vulnerability. Other people would advocate for phrases like food justice, which emphasizes the right to nutritious and culturally appropriate food. Others still would talk about food sovereignty, the idea we have control over the global food system, or some, boot, some do and some don't. And if you're interested in, in pursuing these sorts of definitional disputes, we did a paper in Nature Food a couple of years ago, which talked about whether we frame food as a commodity, as a human right, or a common good. And the implications that has, not just for framing a debate in an academic way, but also for thinking about its policy ramifications. And that paper was part of or, or arose from a working group which I chaired called Towards an EU Sustainable Food System, which was done under the auspices of SAPAIR, the Science Advice for Policy by European Academies. Really interesting process. There's a process where academics produce an evidence review that then goes to the group of chief scientific advisors who are allowed to say a little bit more in terms of recommendations and policy. And then it goes to the Commission, who in this case produced their um, uh, farm to fork uh, policy recommendations. And we were a little bit constrained in that process, the SAPAIA process. So when we were free of the shackles of that, we then published a paper in Nature Food, which was more the kind of, if you like, personal opinions of, of the uh, people writing the report. And it tracks through from the notion of framing to who gets listened to, what ideas prevail, what interests they serve. Okay, should we move on to the next slide, please? So I'm now gonna say a little bit about food and health, and then subsequently about food and environment, and try to bring those often discrete topics together. So globally around 700 million people went hungry in 2019, and more than 1.5 billion experienced deficiencies in essential nutrients. And as I've already said, these processes and patterns are geographically very uneven. Hunger and malnutrition most prevalent in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Overweight is concentrated in the global north. And now a quarter of the UK population is defined as obese with a BMI over 30, projected to rise to more than half by 2050. And just a little word of caution when you're looking at these kind of data, it's really important to distinguish between obesity and overweight, which have different measures in terms of BMI. But these are measures of obesity, not overweight. And these figures are significant, not least because there is a direct connection between people's diet and non-communicable diseases, such as certain kinds of cancer, cardiovascular disease and diabetes. There's therefore pressure from governments and uh, campaign groups to reduce our consumption of saturated fat, salt and sugar, and to increase our consumption of fruit and vegetables. So people will be aware of uh, five a day campaigns or sugar taxes, for example. And we can expect any day now, the government's white paper in response to the national food strategy, and we'll see which of Henry Dimbleby's recommendations uh, are taken forward and the, the, the sugar tax uh, would be a really significant part of that if it, if it gets through the political process currently in train. So sticking with health for a moment, let's look at the next slide. A couple of years ago, uh, the Eat Lancet uh, report came out and caused quite a stir politically. Um, what the Eat Lancet tried to do was to define what it called a reference diet that will be a diet appropriate to 
planetary health, to living within global limits. And they argued that a diet uh, that did that would be predominantly plant-based, vegetarian or vegan, with low amounts of animal-based foods, meat and dairy, refined grains, white bread, for example, or highly processed foods or foods and drinks with added sugars. And to deliver that diet, they argue global consumption of foods such as red meat and sugar would need to decrease by around half, while the consumption of nuts, fruits, vegetables and legumes must double. You can imagine the political groups which lobbied around those kinds of ideas. And part of the argument was what was meant by a reference diet. I think there was a misunderstanding of this, which was unfortunate. And it was, uh, is the Eat Lancet report recommending the same diet for everyone? Is this a prescription? Is this riding roughshod over cultural difference and so on? And it wasn't, it was a reference diet. It was a sort of, um, uh, uh, let's suppose we need to meet these uh, criteria. What diet would we need to do that? But there were questions about the affordability of uh, this reference diet and about its cultural appropriateness. And I haven't said so far, but one of the reasons I'm interested in food is that it's because it's so much more than nutrition. It's much more than minerals and, and vitamins. It has huge social, cultural, political, economic significance, which makes it, a, I think, a fantastic topic to research and one of enormous political significance. So if we move on again, please, next slide. I want to shift from food and health to food and environment before I come back to talk about the connections between them. And I was lucky to be invited to be part of a Royal Society task force looking at a whole range of climate related questions, one of which they gave the title Nourishing 10 Billion Sustainably. And it talked about notions of resilience uh, in a time of climate change. I think because they were the Royal Society, uh, they focus principally on science, technology and agriculture. And my job as a social scientist and geographer is to remind them that uh, you could have all sorts of technological innovation, but if it's not uh, acceptable to the public, if it's not affordable to people in, on all incomes, there'll be a limit to the change we can make. So the Royal Society report talked about uh, the implications of intensive industrialized food production in terms of its adverse effects on the environment, on biodiversity, on resource depletion, on pollution, on climate change, and, and more besides. So it, from a scientific point of view, it review, reviewed peer-reviewed evidence and argued that the intensive food production system was unsustainable. Uh, it also argued that the global food system accounts for one third of greenhouse gas emissions. So there was a direct connection between uh, food production and climate change. And again, one needs to be careful here that uh, one third is the global food system, not just agricultural production. So it would include transportation, distribution and so on as well. The Royal Society concluded that to address these issues effectively would require dietary change, more sustainable agricultural practices, innovations in food production, including biotechnology, and a reduction in food waste. I'll say a bit more about food waste in a moment. I think it's a really interesting area because a lot of people, when they first approach these issues, see that we waste something like a third of the food that's produced, whether that's food loss, um, on farms or food waste in the domestic scale. And it sounds like something quite easy to fix, but it's highly recalcitrant. Our behaviors are deeply embedded and you'll see there are all sorts of interesting reasons that underpin the amount of food that we, we end up wasting. So my next slide please is a little aside about public understanding. And I think there's a really interesting debate going on here uh, I've talked about growing levels of food insecurity in the UK and elsewhere in the world. So you might think that food would be absolutely top of the agenda for all kinds of folks. And if you look back to COP21, you'll see that food was rather a small part of the discussion uh, compared to energy, for example, or other questions. 
And one observer described it as a forgotten phenomenon uh, in those COP debates. So the question is, is it a, a major focus of public concern? And if it isn't, why isn't it? So uh, the National Food Strategy talks about people understanding links between food and health. And through the public dialogue process that I was involved in, they concluded, the National Food Strategy con uh, concluded there was an appetite for change. So food and health increasingly on the agenda, food and environment somewhat less so. Now this is a slightly dated report from the Food Standards Agency called Our Future Food, but it had a really interesting set of arguments about why people struggled to make a connection between food and environment. And this is from the literature review, which was led by Andrew Darnton. And he said, when the dialogue participants are first told about the links between food and environmental impacts, their first response is one of surprise. And he later went on to talk about a lack of awareness bordering on denial. I think this is interesting. Uh, I, I think it's a rather derogatory view of public understanding, which I'll criticise in just a moment. Um, and it's partly how the question is formulated, I would argue. So pe people have very strong views about food waste or about plastic packaging and so on. There's no evidence there of a lack of awareness bordering on denial. So I think this sort of um, accusation is worth pursuing a little bit. So before I move on to uh, more things about environment, let me just talk a bit about a deficit approach. So the next slide has that as its title. Uh, what's happened, Vinnie? One more, please. That's it. So uh, it's a slightly technical social science-y kind of, oh, we've gone forward too far. Can we just go back one slide? That's it. So social, social scientists talk about it. Oh. One more, I think. That's it. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, no. <laughs> We've got indigestion at the moment. There's a bit of a lag, I think, on pressing the button and the slides catching up with us. I think Let we only need to be back one more. Just go back one and we'll, we'll just confirm you get back to it. Just go back one. A system. No, it's the deficit. The deficit, the the deficit is what we want, yeah? Yeah. Deficit. Right. Thank yes. you, Peter. Yeah, De sorry deficit, about that. Deficit thinking is not what we want, but this is the slide that we want, yes. So one of my arguments is that it's very easy for governments, uh, for the media, uh, for commentators of all kinds to focus on a deficit in public understanding or citizen knowledge. And one of the, the key roles, I think, for social scientists is to counter this, what I regard as a patronizing view. And so, you know, when you read the media and policy debates, watch out for this idea that the public lack something or that consumers uh, lack skill or knowledge or whatever, or even the will to change. I think that is largely a misunderstanding of public awareness and public understanding. So the rhetoric emphasizes a dearth, a lack, a deficit of something, understanding, skills, forethought, and so on. And this applies across many food-related domains and is often, in my view, misplaced. So there was a whole debate about the nature of domestic household-level food waste and accusations thrown about in the media that we were a, a throwaway society. We couldn't care less. And then more detailed, attentive, ethnographic work, including work by my colleague David Evans, suggested that there was that, that people cared a lot about food. They were not happy-go-lucky throwing away without any forethought. And the research that David Evans did and others demonstrated the range of reasons that lead to food waste. So it might be uh, to do with the dynamics of households, people eating at different times, people having different tastes or food preferences. It might be to do with uh, people's work schedules, uh, all sorts of reasons, um, not just 
a kind of attitude that leads to a careless approach to food. The same is true of, of food safety debates. I had this discussion in the Food Standards Agency for a very long time. The Food Standards Agency was fed up with these feckless consumers who didn't listen to their very well-intentioned advice. So why would it be that many households continue to wash raw poultry in the sink under the tap without realizing that they're spreading contamination uh, around their food environments? And again, those are kitchen hygiene practices that have consequences in terms of public health, but simply telling them they're doing it wrong and that they should do something different from what they've done is not a good place to start in my view. We need to start with where people are and build from that. So if people are washing chicken for ritual purposes or because they don't like the blood and skin and feathers and feces on the chicken, we need to understand that before we issue a kind of public health campaign which just tells them that that's wrong and they should do something else. And the same is true of uh, all those debates about cooking skills, the decline of Sunday lunch, all those kinds of stuff, uh, where Jamie Oliver was very prominent with his Ministry of Food and talked about sinner ladies and junk food mums just up the road from us here in Sheffield in, in Rotherham. And I could, uh, I, you know, I had a PhD student who looked very specifically at that uh, particular moment and the kind of blaming that went on, which I think missed much of the point. So um, all of these examples, and there are many more, tend to ignore what my colleague Anne Murcott once described as good reasons for bad behaviour, and notice that those are in scare quotes. So behaviour that government advice, public health campaigns and so on would regard as bad uh, or needing to change, often have their own logic. It may be, not be the same logic as food safety authorities would hope they'd have, but there is a logic and we ignore that logic at our peril, I would suggest. Okay, next slide, please. So all of this, I think, this argument that there's a gap between research on food health and food and environment, this notion of there being a deficit and so on, to me, speaks of the need for more joined up thinking. So food security, sustainability and health are often treated as separate issues, treated in their own little silos by different communities of practice. Um, but food fundamentally links across domains. And just one way of illustrating, I, I don't know what you think about the sustainable development goals, lots of debate and argument about them. But if you look at those sustainable development goals, you could make a case for food being relevant to well, all of them, certainly for most of them, and especially of the links between them. So we've talked about food poverty, uh, we, we've talked about hunger, uh, and, and so on. Clearly there are gender issues in relation to farming, but also domestic household practice. There are issues around waste, there are issues around inequality, there are issues around climate, and so on. So food to me demands this kind of joined up, connected approach, which suggests that what's sometimes called food systems thinking is a good way of avoiding silos and transcending disciplinary domains. So let me say something uh, on the next slide about what I mean by systems thinking or a systems approach. Okay, so here we go. So uh, part of what we're doing in our Institute for Sustainable Food in Sheffield is to try and think about new ways of understanding the complexity of agri-food systems and to move beyond linear notions that food moves from farm to fork in a nice straightforward supply chain model. We're also interested in transcending domains between production and consumption and looking at the integration of, well, I say here, natural and social science research. Our institute in Sheffield, we're very proud of the fact we have people from all five of the university's faculties, including arts, humanities, including medicine, dentistry and health and so on. And part of the distinctiveness of our approach is that we regard food security not just as a scientific or technical challenge, but also of one with deep social and cultural roots. And that demands integration combining research in different disciplines 
a wide range of stakeholders from industry, government, and the third sector. So the next two slides start with the first, which is the conventional linear farm to fork kind of idea. You start with farmland, for example, you grow some crops, they're turned into products which are then sold in supermarkets and other retail outlets as food, and they then reach consumers and have implications for health, for example. That will be a very conventional farm to fork approach, whereas the second slide uh, suggests a more, the, the, the same line is there in the middle of the diagram, but you'll see above it, there are a whole series of different food system actors, corporate actors in agri-industry, researchers, farmers, and so on, processors, distributors, a wide range of people selling food, wide range of modes of provisioning food, all of which are subject to external factors to do with climate, weather, geography, and so on. And then beneath the, the, the linear conception, there are notions of inputs and outputs and a more circular or um, complex set of connections. Now, this is not just, some people say this is academics making things unnecessarily complicated. And thank you very much for pointing out how complex the world is. I think it's more than that. I think if you don't take this kind of systems approach, it's very easy to make, uh, to have perverse effects. You tinker with something over here without realizing it has consequences over there. Or you miss important trade-offs between different parts of the food system. So you might support organic production because of its beneficial effects on the environment, but then you might end up needing to import organic food from around the world uh, because it's not all available locally. Or you might assume uh, one mode of production is inherently superior to another without thinking through consumer taste or preference or affordability. So I think there's a good case to be made for a, a, a more integrated and, and systems-based approach. Can we move on to the next section then, which is about what I call the, the roots of the current agri-food crisis. This is Sir John Beddington, who some of you may have come across when he was government chief scientific advisor, who used this phrase, a perfect storm. And he was particularly interested in what had happened to food prices in 2007 and 8, when there was a spike in agricultural commodities that fed through to an increase in food prices. But he just gives here a really interesting list of a whole variety of things that came together as a, as a global food crisis. Pressure on agricultural land, which is really where I started. Increasing demand for meat and animal products, sometimes referred to as the nutrition transition. So when people in, let's say, China or India who have traditionally eaten diets which are high in uh, rice, for example, and vegetables, move to diets which are higher in meat and dairy on a kind of Western model, that increases demand. Climate change, which leads to a scarcity of food, water and energy sources, um, as well as more frequent uh, weather events, severe weather events. Increasing commodity prices, which was the sort of driver for his interest in this at the time, fed by higher energy prices and the cost of agricultural inputs, such as animal feed and fertilizers. Land being switched from agricultural production for human food consumption to biofuel production. And then the whole kind of policy uh, context of their reform in the common agricultural policy, leading to a temporary lowering of stocks, series of droughts and poor harvests, and then a kind of economic market response to speculation, stockpiling, hoarding, and land grabs around the world. So I think that's a really useful sort of summary of a range of factors that are going on that influence uh, the agri-food system leading to what in the mid-2000s was regarded as a crisis. If we move on to the next slide, this is sort of a, a, an introductory geography lecture, so I'll skip over these couple of slides. But certainly if you look at the recent history of agricultural production, you could argue it's taken a, a it's had a, an industrialization or an intensification process. So a good example would be intensively reared broiler chickens, 
where improvements in feed conversion ratio, in other words, how much input, how much food you need in order to fatten chickens up uh, to be fully grown, there's been a very dramatic reduction in the time. It's become much more efficient slash um, intensive. And that slide on the right is from uh, PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. So it's a campaign slide. Accompanying this process of industrialization, we've also, in the UK at least, seen a, a very strong concentration of retail power among a small number of players. So this is a slide from the UK government and talks about the way in which four firms now account for around 75% of grocery sales. Putting smaller uh, independents out of business, you could argue that's efficient, you could argue that has uh, negative consequences. My next slide is alongside that industrialization of food production, there's clearly been a globalization of agri-food systems. And I was searching for a slide for this, and this idea of the globe as a hamburger appealed to me. So if you think about where food comes from, increasing the global supply. So if you had a prawn sandwich for lunch, it's quite likely the prawns came from Thailand. If you have an apple uh, mid-afternoon, might well have come from New Zealand, even though we can grow many varieties of apples in the UK. And if you go out for chicken tonight, it's quite likely that the chicken in a processed meal uh, came from Brazil. Many products have ingredients from literally all over the world. I wrote a paper with yet more alliteration called Kit Kat Connections, which simply mapped the variety of product, the variety of uh, yeah, products in, in a, a piece of confectionery, which almost literally span the globe. So we're aware of this set of globalization tendencies, but I think we should be aware of some oversimplification to those arguments. So Tim Lang famously invented the idea of food miles, which is a really nice sort of handy mnemonic, a bit like air miles, but is slightly misleading, I think. Not all local food is healthier or more sustainable than food from further away. For example, uh, if your tomatoes are grown under the sun in Almeria in Spain, that's probably more energy efficient than growing them in a heated polytunnel here in the UK. So food miles is a slightly misleading argument, I think. And similarly, there are trade-offs. I think I mentioned before, if you want to have organic food, we probably can't grow enough of it in the UK, so we're likely to import it. Okay, next slide, please. So these issues about industrialization and globalization, I think lead to questions about the transparency of supply chains or their traceability. And this was revealed uh, very starkly in 2013 when there was the so-called horse meat incident, as the government referred to it, or scandal or crisis or whatever. So horse meat was found to be put in burgers from not just Tesco, this happened to be the headlines on that day. Um, and how did that happen? And Tesco said, well, we had no idea, we used subsidiaries um, and they let us down. Uh, what's interesting about the map, I think, is that the, the solid line shows the actual route taken by horse meat to get to the UK from suppliers and abattoirs in Romania uh, through France and Luxembourg to the UK. But there's a much more complex and interesting set of things going on in the dotted lines, which is all the intermediaries and the traders who were phoning each other up or faxing or texting or whatever you did back then in 2013. And you see a very much more complex set of arrangements that lead to horse meat arriving in the UK, at least to begin with undetected. So an argument was that the supply chains had become uh, were less traceable and Tesco issued full page apologies in the newspapers and, and so on. So I think all of these things I've been talking about, globalization, industrialization, intensification and so on, have led to a kind of backlash. And my next slide talks not so much about a political economy of food, but about a moral economy of food. And people like Kevin Morgan and colleagues wrote a book called Worlds of Food in 2006, which talked about two opposing trends, what they called a neoliberal economy and a new moral economy. Again, we could debate how new that moral economy is. You know, if you go back to the roots of fair trade and so on, but there are a whole series of things going on 
in this new moral economy, alternative food networks, the slow food movement, the rise of organics, ethical consumption, including but not limited to fair trade, and insistence on local food or seasonal food are more sustainable forms of consumption. This is an important part of the economy, but it's small. It's important but partly because it's growing, um, but this slide uh, from treasury sources suggests that even if you put all of these so-called ethical foods together, organic, fair trade, free trade, uh, freedom foods and so on, it might account for 5% of a typical shopping basket. So it's, it's growing, um, but from quite a small basis. And the other argument, of course, is it often has a price premium, which puts it beyond the reach of many consumers. OK, we're coming towards the end of the talk now. I just wanted to say a few things about my current research project, this H3 project, Healthy Soil, Healthy Food, Healthy People, which tries to put into practice some of the things we've been talking about in previous slides. So it tries to bring together food, health and sustainability. It's part of a, a very large program called Transforming UK Food Systems, uh, where UKRI is a funder, but so is Food Standards Agency, DEFRA and so on. Our, our strap line is that we, you know, the idea of starting with the soil is that we're transforming the UK food system from the ground up. And we're also really keen to work across scales, literally from lab science to work in the field and the farm, out into a wider landscape, and then encompassing cities and communities across the UK. And it has a UK focus, but clearly our imports come from many other parts around the world. The next slide is rather hideous, I'm afraid, uh, but it tries to encapsulate the programme we're working on. So on the left-hand side, there are a whole series of policy drivers from different government departments, some of whom were funding the research. On the right hand side, you see that we're moving through from sustainable production to healthy consumption and all the places in between. The six work packages include, like I said, some uh, lab based work on improving the efficiency and the resistance to pests of um, uh, hydroponically produced foods. The second takes that hydroponic production uh, out to a wider scale, I think. So it's not just producing high-end, so, uh, producing fancy herbs for high-end restaurants. It's trying to make it more widely available. It's then in Work Package 3 taking this out to the landscape scale. So looking in uh, the east of England and down in the south of England in different farm landscapes. We're interested in biofortification um, as a way in which commonly consumed foods can be fortified to be more nutritious. In work package five, we're interested in increasing fibre consumption, particularly in low income communities, through not just insisting people change to foods they don't already have, but by maybe enhancing foods they already enjoy, like bagels, for example, a kind of health by stealth, some people refer to this as. And then the sixth um, work package is about supply chain disruptions. There are some cross-cutting themes, that's what the CTs are, and there is stakeholder engagement throughout from the very stage when we were designing the research through to a year's funding we've secured beyond the five years of the programme to make sure that if these ideas have traction that they can be scaled up and, and rolled out more widely. Uh, there's a paper in Nutrition Bulletin if you wanted to know more about the H3 project. The reason I'm pleased with it, so we're one year into this big project, the next slide shows some examples of how this stuff can make a difference. So if, if what I've been saying before about joining up and systems thinking, if this is true, then we need to think about the way in which uh, people in those work packages talk to each other, uh, move out of their silo and engage in more cross-cutting work. And here is literally off the top of my head a couple of days ago, uh, a, a series of ways in which that might happen. So there's lots of arguments about regenerative agriculture or more sustainable modes of production and so on. Does that lead to tastier, more nutritious food? We don't really know. The Soil Association tried to make that claim 10 years ago and the Food Standards Agency 
took them to court basically and, and, and forbade them from making those claims. So could we as part of this project demonstrate that more regenerative modes of agriculture led to better tasting, more nutritious, more appealing foods? Secondly, uh, we're in the process of mapping, measuring and monitoring this transition to more sustainable or more regenerative agriculture. That fits very nicely with current government policies about environmental land management, so-called ELMS process, which is, which is replacing um, cap payments. The third one, deceptively simple this, soil health. We're all in favour of soil health. Soil health is really important for the planet and for food. No one knows how to measure it. There are some measures uh, about soil compaction or about pH, for example. They're useful for some purposes, but I think rather than trying to produce a single effective measure, there's work to be done that shows how different kinds of measures are fit for different kinds of purposes. The fourth one I've mentioned just in passing, so we can skip that, hydroponic production, not just for high-end restaurants, but also for feeding urban communities. There's a real virtuous circle here. If hydroponic production is happening in urban or peri-urban environments, there is a workforce, it's close to centres of demand, and there is real potential for that in my view. Biofortification we mentioned in terms of improving nutritional quality of popularly consumed foods rather than assuming we need to, everyone to change their diet fundamentally and the fibre consumption one I mentioned where we can uh, start to introduce these as part of school breakfast programmes. Okay I think I've got two or three more slides and then we're done. I'm sorry if I'm overrunning slightly. So my next slide is again part of my geographical way of thinking I think. What is the local responsibility for food system change? If we can agree that we want more sustainable agriculture or we want dietary change or whatever we want, whose responsibility is that? And my critique, a bit like the critique I made of deficit thinking, is that a lot of policy, uh, obesity, uh, food waste and so on, tends to be highly individualized. It tends to talk about consumer choice. Give consumers a choice, give them information and they're then responsible for the consequences. That seems to be not a very sophisticated sociological imagination. So government policy has shifted a bit I think now, so on obesity for example it will talk about the food environment but it still falls back on this language of empowering people to make healthier choices and I think choice is a, is a very loaded word in these contexts. I think it also tends to de-emphasize what I call wider systems of practice, which for sake of argument, we could refer to as institutions or infrastructure and all the things that shape individual choice. And this is beyond the kind of nudge way of thinking of Thaler and Sunstein. I think it leads to too little discussion of the power asymmetries that shape our contemporary agri-food systems. So I think again, another key role for social scientists like me is to bring these power geometries out into the open and show the influence they have on policy and practice. Okay, my next slide is my conclusion. And then I have a final slide, which is some contact details, should you want them. So yeah, maybe just put all, all four of the uh, bullets up to start with. So what I've tried to do is to argue a case for more, a more sustainable food system, which meets the twin aims of human health and planetary prosperity. So back to my alliterative title. I think this demands that we take a more integrated view of agri-food systems than has often been the case in the past, where we emphasize links between health and sustainability, under and over consumption, global north and global south, and natural and social science. I think we also need to make connections across scales whether that's in the lab, in the field, in communities, and between sectors, production and consumption and all that lies between. And I want to give the final word to my friend and colleague Warren Belasco, an American food historian. In his book, Appetite for Change, he suggested that food is an edible dynamic, binding present and past, individual and society, private household and world economy, palate and power. It has some alliteration, so it immediately gets my approval, but also I think is all about 
the kind of only connect argument that I've been trying to make this afternoon. So my last slide simply gives you some contacts uh, if you want them, uh, some websites, and even the little promotional film we made for the H3 project. So could you put the last slide up while we move into the next phase? So I think I went on a little bit too long. No, no, that was, so that was wonderful, Peter. Thank you so, so, so much. Um, perhaps we could talk about a few uh, issues just before we open up to the, to the floor. So one of the great sticking points for um, change in the food system in part in the UK is an argument about how those in the bottom 20% of the population can't afford to eat well. And so therefore, we have to carry on giving them food, which we know is not as good as it could be. So this particularly applies to foodstuffs which are thought to be important to households. So milk, for example, the price of milk, um, the price of bread, uh, and a few other commodities that you will know much more about and can explain to the audience. But the issue here, of course, is that there are a set of intersecting problems here. So for example, supermarkets claim <clears throat> that they can't pay farmers properly for the production of food because it costs too much. And if they did that, they'd have to raise the price of milk and therefore people can't afford proper milk. So therefore we should not give people proper milk or indeed produce it. Now, how do you see, I know I have strong views about this myself, as you can probably tell by the rather loaded way I've asked you the question, but I'd just be very interested in hearing you talk about how we approach this conundrum for, for those on the call. Okay, um, it's interesting we focus on the role of supermarkets. Yeah. And they, in a way, uh, Terry Marsden wrote a wonderful book called Consuming Interests, where oh, he yeah. argued that supermarkets had sort of seized, the, they, they represented the consumer. They gave the consumer what they wanted. Yeah. Uh, and that was their job uh, yeah. to do. Uh, and I think that's a misrepresentation of their role in the agri-food system. Mm. Um, I think it ignores the whole policy environment of what we incentivize or subsidize or reward. So I kind of share, people talk about the true cost of food mm. and certainly in the UK we spend a much lower proportion of our budget on food than in other neighboring continental countries. Mm. So maybe we have the, the true cost of food, cost of food production is not represented in in the price in the supermarkets. Mm. Um, but if you, again, following your argument, if we raised the price of food to its true costs, that would have very damaging effects on, you said the bottom 20%, but on poorer households. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the part of your argument there, that the point of the locus of responsibility, to use my phrase, yeah. is, a, is a regulatory environment. And in that Sapaya report, we, we talked about the levers for change and how there was a lot of emphasis on nudge and behavior change, consumer attitudes and all the rest. But if you don't put that along, that would not lead to the scale of change we need. For that, we also need more fiscal, more regulatory change, mm -hmm. which is not popular um, with the current government. No, but it's a very interesting argument because we, in the IGP, we've been working on something which we call universal basic services. <clears throat> and we've been arguing that there needs to be a new basket of public goods for the 21st century in order to allow societies to thrive and flourish in the way that a redefined notion of prosperity suggests that they could. And one of them involves uh, treating food as a universal basic service. Yeah. And partly because of the, the consequences of not doing so are so deleterious for the ongoing well-being, not only of the animals that, that produce this food, but also for soil, water, et cetera, et cetera. So that taking your systemic point of view means that you can't afford just to, to claim and allow supermarkets to claim that they're providing cheap food for the poorest, which is a moral position that they're arguing from, or a moral high ground, if you like, that, they, that they've taken up. I think that's true. And I think th that little paper I referred to in, uh, it's a commentary in Nature Food a year or two ago, mm. made exactly that case that uh, food was not, only, it is a commodity, but it's not only a commodity. And if you think about notions of the common good, that sounds similar to what you're doing in the IGP. Mm. And um, uh, the, the, um, the group of chief scientific advisors to the European Commission, 
argued that the Commission should move towards uh, the common good position. Yeah. Yeah. And then disappointingly, the farm to fork strategy hardly did that at all. It was full of consumers and consumer choice and so on. And that's, yeah. that's why we ended up doing that commentary. Yes, yes. So coming on then to the question of hydroponic farming, which is of great interest again to us in the IGP, not only because we've been working on it in the UK, but of course because we're working on it in Africa also, where there is great potential for hydroponic farming. Um, how we do it is a, is a, a question of some quite difficult governance choices. But in terms of the livability, long-term livability of cities and bringing food consumption nearer to home, I mean, how do you how how quickly do you think we could move to significant change uh, in that part of the production for urban food populations? Yeah, I think hydroponics is small but significant and has huge potential. Mm. Um, and and even even in quite poor communities in Sheffield, we work with a local food co-op called Regather, and Regather has a, a mini farm uh, in the inner city part of Sheffield near. Sheffield United football ground so, uh, along London Road, which if you know Sheffield is, is yeah. full of so-called ethnic restaurants and so on. So hydroponics has been something which has been niche. Mm. Um, and I think it's now moving from that niche towards something which is much more uh, widespread. I think there's also, you talked about work in Africa. Uh, mm. My colleagues here have done a project called Desert Garden, which mm -hmm. is working uh, mm. with the United Nations High Commission for Refugees in a Syrian refugee camp called Zatari. And they were able, it was a fantastic project. Uh, just look up Desert Garden and Sheffield and you'll find it. Um, they found lots of disused mattresses in a warehouse in this refugee camp and were able to use that as a non-soil growth medium for a whole range of foods. And it was, I think it was a fabulous project. Um, and part of the issue in refugee camps is you literally can't put roots down. You can't plant things in the soil because it mm. gives you a, a different sort of status and longevity. Mm. So the Desert Garden Project was a really interesting attempt <coughs> to grow food hydroponically in, in, in a highly constrained uh, environment. Yeah. And the other one is my colleague Sue Hartley, uh, who has a project uh, combining hydroponics and photovoltaics. Yeah, so they've they've put um, photovoltaics not on people's roofs, but at sort of mid height, and underneath that they're growing crops using mm -hmm. hydroponics, mm -hmm. and they're also storing rainwater and doing all sorts of other really interesting things. Mm -hmm. So, in, in some, I think that hydroponics and related uh, aquaponics and so on have um, a lot of potential, and particularly in terms of their location close to population centres. Yeah. So it's yeah. not like growing things in the fens of East Anglia where we exhaust the peat, where we can't get agricultural labour and where it has to be shipped halfway across the UK to big population centres. Mm. I think hydroponics as a sort of urban agriculture has great potential. Yeah, great. Now, I think we should open up to the floor because now we've mentioned everybody's favourite topic in the last few minutes. We've got lots and lots of questions for you. So, but let me start first with two questions from Flavia and then we'll come back to some questions from the panel and mix and match. So Flavia's got two questions. She said, could you, thank you, could you please explain a bit more about how agricultural land is being reduced uh, due to climate change? And also ask you if you could say more about um, the statement that food production accounts for a third of greenhouse gas emissions, because this really is a, as she sees it, a Western world problem. It's not, it doesn't account for a third in Africa, or she's asking, does it? Could we look to African production systems to have less carbon intensive production? Yep. Okay, I'll do my best. <laughs> okay. The trouble with food is it's so broad. I know. <laughs> you can't be an expert on all of it. Everything. I know, I know. <laughs> I'll do my best. So the agricultural land reduction is because with climate change uh, and more extreme weather events, the places where you can grow food are shrinking. I mean, desertification would be an extreme example of it. But also things like urbanization are paving over areas which once were agricultural land. So that, that's the argument is that agricultural land is a finite resource um, in absolute terms, but is shrinking uh, in relative terms because other things are taking over former agricultural land and the places where uh, 
food is conventionally produced are less conducive to food production. The uh, greenhouse gas emissions figure is an interesting and controversial one. It's often expressed as a between this and that, and that this and that is a very broad range. Yes. But th this, this greenhouse gas emission uh, argument of, of one third is in that um, Royal Society report, and it has um, you know, sources for it. But it is, as, as uh, Flavia's question suggests, a, a global average and will be very different in different parts of the world. So certainly different parts of the world have much less, have much lower impact agricultural systems than we would have in the UK or in North America, for example. Great. So the next question is from uh, uh, Ida Kowiszewski and she's on the panel. So Ida can ask you her question in person. So she's gonna do that and open up her thing. Ida, please. Thanks, Henrietta, and thanks for a great talk, Peter. Um, I was just wondering, over the last two years, life has slowed down for all of us. Um, restaurants have been closed. People have had to change how they eat. How have we seen that shift during COVID towards slow food? Um, and then now that COVID is lifting in most places, um, how are we seeing some of that being retained or not? Okay, good question. Probably too early to answer in any definitive way, I think. But I don't think COVID has led to slow food in the sense it's traditionally used. The yeah. slow food movement is a very specific niche. People meet in convivia, they have fine wines and right, high right. quality food and all of that. So I think I, I, I don't think it's slow food in that sense of the term. Um, but COVID has been this amazing social experiment which has had horrendous uh, implications for large proportions of the population but has also allowed some observation of the kind of behavior change that you could barely imagine outside of this kind of crisis environment. I think one of the key things that COVID has done is to um, emphasize, uh, exaggerate existing inequalities. So I think if you look at What's the impact of COVID been on poor communities, or black and minority ethnic communities, and so on? There are clear patterns there. So that is, I think, not something new, but it's a, 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 an extenuation—is that the word—of um, existing inequalities. So I think we can we can show that. I think it's also demonstrated, well, it's demonstrated a huge disconnect between uh, medicine and social science approaches. I think that case has been made by a lot of people. But I, I think you're right. In a way, uh, people have not gone to the shops as much as they did. They've ordered things online. Uh, people have grown more of their own food in their back gardens. All, all those kinds of changes have happened. And as with many of these sort of experiments, uh, the question is, will, how, how prevalent are they and how long will they stick? Okay. And I think we, we need a longer lens uh, for observing that. But I think the immediate impact has been on uh, the kind of inequalities I was talking about in relation to, to vulnerable households. Yeah, yeah, very, very, very interesting. And we have a question now from MJ Ascenzo, who's saying, do you consider the moral view that you put forward of the framework of the food system is actually a reflection of how we should model towards natural planetary prosperity? And if so, what would be for you the priority elements and factors to consider in the model so that it actually allows the necessary transition towards uh, food security and presumably sustainability. <clears throat> I'll have a go at that. Um, part of my argument would be a sort of auto critique, I think. It's not that there is a, a moral economy mm. over here and a political economy over there. Uh, mm. uh, a political economy is underpinned by all kinds of ethical and moral questions, which are often not uh, brought to the fore. Mm. So I think the, the, the Morgan and um, Marsden and Murdoch's book, uh, Worlds of Food, slightly overplayed the contrast. So we can think about um, the way in which morality underpins markets. Mm. Think of the way that markets uh, advertise or brand uh, around notions of freshness or purity or whatever. Those are ethical claims that they're making, even in a so-called mainstream, or Marsden et al would say, neoliberal climate. So I think that all of that is true. Um, my argument in the presentation was that the 
the people who brand themselves as moral or ethical are a, a minority of people. Mm. And there's a sort of, um, uh, what did Clive Barnett call it? A moral selving going on, a seizing of the moral high ground. You know, they're the mm. good people moving in the right direction. And, and that's why I think the, um, the 5% or whatever it is that, um, you know, that, that report suggested is, is, is interesting and is significant. Mm. It's not that other, the, the trouble with our ethical consumption is that it means everybody else is unethical and you're seizing yeah. the label for yourself. And I think it's as important, probably more important to look at the kind of ethics and uh, morality, which underpins a more industrialized and conventional food system. So I did a lot of work in the past on chicken production um, and retailing through Marks and Spencer and their Oakham brand of chicken, mm. which made all kinds of claims about taste, about provenance, about quality and so on. These are moral claims, I think, mm. even in a highly commercial environment. So that kind of notion of you know, alternative and mainstream has a very interesting and blurred line between it. Yeah. I think I've only read <laughs> half of that question. I'm sorry, I've... No, no, I think that, no, I think, as you say, it's, food is everything, so you can't answer everything. But we're, we're, and also, we've, everyone's getting very excited behind the scenes, so we, I'm going to keep moving along if you, if, you're, right. if you don't yep. mind, Peter. So another question then from Tatiana, who's saying that in addition to the food sector, other ones are increasing their dependency on organic plants to produce goods. For example, the sustainable fashion industry to produce fabrics and colors by natural dye processes. And assuming that the fashion and others are depending on the same land to produce these organic plants, I mean, what kinds of impacts and effects can we expect in the next few years related to food and indeed other sectors? So this is a competition question, I guess, in part. I think it is. And uh, I've mentioned briefly in passing that, um, uh, you know, producing food for humans mm. versus producing food for biofuel was another of those kinds of trends. Yes. Yes. I, I don't, yeah. To be honest, I don't know enough about uh, sustainable fashion to make a very intelligent response to the question but it's mm. absolutely the kind of argument I was making about systems thinking you do something which is good over here um, you know in increase the consumption of, of of organic food or try to row back against fast fashion towards something which is more sustainable and might use organic cotton for example but the links between sectors I was just dealing with agri-food, but if yeah. you extend it to energy or fashion or other commodities, I mm -hmm. think that's interesting. I also think fashion is dead interesting because it's similar to food in some ways. It's mm -hmm. not actually ingested in the way food is, but it's really close and embodied. It's, yeah. it's part mm -hmm. of identity. It's part of who we are. So it's, it's again, it's this idea that as things can be reduced to just a commodity. I think food and fashion demonstrate the limits of that way of thinking. Wonderful. And now we have coming from the panel a question from Bob Costanza. And Bob's on the panel, so he can ask his question in person. So Bob, please. Hi. Yeah, thank you, Peter. That was a very comprehensive and, and, uh, and wonderful uh, presentation. And I really appreciated your emphasis on the, the whole um, need for a systems approach and looking at all of the interconnections between these pieces like you just answered in the last question. And I guess um, my question is, well, a, a couple of things. Uh, first, are you, are you doing any systems dynamics modeling uh, of these interconnected systems uh, to really get at some of those interconnections and, and how to deal with them? And I think if you, uh, you know, once you start thinking about the whole system, I think it becomes clear too that, that we are gonna need a, a full scale transformation of the system of, of, of many of the different parts. It's not one thing changing as we know from understanding uh, systems, that you can't just change one thing and expect, expect the system to, uh, to, really, to really change. So um, how would we go about uh, that sort of systems level transformation uh, that's really gonna be needed, I think, to, to, to solve some of the, the problems that you've clearly identified? Well, thank you, Bob. This is the question I've been fearing, I have to say, because when, when I was lined up here in a, in a seminar series about modelling, I, I told the organisers I, I don't really do the modelling, uh, but um, if you want to hear me, I'm happy to talk. Uh, that, that's slightly flippant, um, but I think you're right. Uh, this food systems diagram that I put up, written by Peter Halton and colleagues, including myself, 
goes some way towards how you would parameterize the food systems. What would you measure? What would you, what, what, and the problem is, of course, the things you can measure easily aren't the things you really need to measure. So there's all sorts of those sorts of questions involved. Um, and to be honest, our H3 programme is not doing food systems modelling in the way you've been referring to it. But we have opened up some conversations with colleagues in systems engineering who are interested in exactly these questions. And I suppose the closest we get to it at the moment is uh, using things like life cycle assessment to try to stop uh, things which appear to be good but are short term or very circumscribed and where if you map things out more in a more comprehensive way uh, you might reach quite different conclusions but yeah i'm not a i'm not a food system modeler so that was a very partial answer to your question <laughs> okay so let's move right along so um alexandra uh, sadler is saying you mentioned the problematic emphasis on individual consumer responsibility. Could you please say a little more about the division of responsibility between the public and the private sector and between corporations and government? Yes, how, how long have you got? Um, <laughs> um, I have a particular, uh, I think the idea of consumer choice and individual choice is a particular bone of uh, contention. I think as social scientists, that's something we have to uh, argue strongly against mm. uh, and it's it's the easy pit in a way isn't it you say there's too much emphasis on that and then the question becomes okay so where else in this system does responsibility lie uh, attribution problems and so on but to me the big system players are uh, agri-food corporations and retailers so that's where i would start in terms of responsibility and if i were government in terms of regulation incentivizing fiscal uh, taxation and so on. So I think uh, that's where I'm at on that. I think that just it's an aside really, but uh, the, my particular beef about uh, individual consumer choice is it reduces the public or publics to people at, in the marketplace at the point of purchase where we buy stuff. And the, the argument from the retailers is always, we're just doing what uh, the public want. The public are voting with their feet. If they don't buy it, we won't make it, those kinds of arguments. And that seems to be a very naive view of consumption as a process and reduces it to consumers and the very specific role that consumers have um, in the marketplace. So again, when I read the literature, I, I watch out for this idea of, are we talking about public or publics? Are we talking about consumers? Are we talking about individuals? And that is often a really good way in to seeing what kind of argument is being made and where you might want to critique it. So that's a rather elliptical answer to the question. But I think if you have this kind of food systems approach, you can start to see a range of actors in there. And often you get a rather, um, what's the phrase? The sort of bell, no, it's not even that. You start with lots of, lots of growers lots of consumers and then a much more constricted uh, part where there are retailers and corporations in the middle who have I think disproportionate power uh, in the system and that's where we need to to focus our attention and it's often not what social scientists do because it's it's quite impenetrable often um, and people have a distaste for it uh, but my argument is if you don't work with those parts of the food sector you're you're missing a lot of very important players very powerful players yes no i think that must be the case we're currently doing that work in kenya at the moment on all the people in the middle of these things um let's turn now then to uh jackie mcglade who's also on the panel who can ask her own question jackie please hi thanks very much Anita. thank you peter um i wanted you to come back maybe full circle around this idea of the landscape restoration and you know what that looks like from the perspective of you know, where you're coming from in H3. And the question I want to ask you has to do with the pressures on one side, for example, you know, you've got the Environment Agency complaining about the fact that if we put manure on the land, it's going to end up, you know, contaminating water. And, and that big picture of landscape restoration is beginning to percolate into farmers are the bad guys again, you know, because they're doing this stuff and it's all ending up in the rivers and so forth. 
And you talk a bit about competency groups um, and, and how that might um, work in, in more of the research side. But I'm just wondering, do you have any ideas about how we can get over this rapprochement between, you know, essentially farmers being the source of all diffuse pollution and therefore, you know, what they're putting on the land is also contaminating the water and it's not necessarily tying up to a very healthy story with manures and, and sewage waste and so on. Because what, what I see there is a bit like the systems discussion. People come in, each one of these problems, asking a tiny little bit of the problem, and no one really steps back and tries to think about the whole landscape restoration and health. And I'm just wondering how, you, how you're thinking about slotting all these different viewpoints in so that you can get an end to end, just like you were doing for your supply chain. Yeah, thank you. Really good question. Hard to answer in a few seconds. Um, I, I think the work package three is the one which addresses this, which is led by my colleague Lynn Dix in Cambridge. And it's doing a mixture of uh, environmental measures, you know, what can we measure, um, what, what is likely to be um, rewarded by um, particularly ELM policy, um, and, and social science work with farmers about why they do what they do. And those engaged in more uh, regenerative agriculture might be environmentally motivated, but they're as likely to be driven by economic incentives. And there's a sort of virtuous circle there, isn't it, where you can do the right thing environmentally, but also uh, pull down the subsidies uh, for it. Um, so I'm, the work we're doing uh, in Cambridgeshire and in Allenford in the West Country is, uh, they're called farm, farm clusters. And I think they cluster partly because they're like-minded communities of practice, but also partly because there is some incentive for doing that. And I think that we've just literally started this work a couple of weeks ago, but I think some of the interesting stuff there is that farmers often represented as the bad guys, they hate the idea that driving their tractor over a field, uh, picking up loads of soil and fertilizer and whatever, they then have to wash down their tractors and it goes into, you know, it's, it's the diffuse source of pollution you're talking about. They, they literally, they see money going down the drain when they do that, they hate that or when you have to spray um, a seed drill afterwards because it's full of dust, that's, you know, that's their dust, that's their soil, it's their land. So I think there are, there is at least the potential for working with those groups if they're not defined in this sort of kind of demonized way that you, you were referring to. And it may not be all farmers. I think the kind of farmers who sign up to be part of clusters and sign up for projects like H3 are probably not the most representative of farmers in the UK. But there is a good number of them. They have an appetite for this. And I think we're, I think we are learning from them. And part of the learning is a bit like, you know, not the deficit model I've referred to for consumers, but similarly not for, for farmers as well. Farmers. We have a farming cluster in uh, the upper plant in Essex, part of the climate focus area, 50 farmers. Might be very interesting to, to have a chat with that, with you about that afterwards. Yeah, please do. I put my contact details up. So um, yeah, you're very welcome to it. get in touch. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Thanks. Very good. Very good. So now, uh, going moving on, uh, Juan He is saying, what's your view on the latest plant-based meat trend? Does it be benefit the human and the environment at the same time as the adverts suggest? Or is it <laughs> hype mainly driven by the hot money of financial investors? <laughs> That's a very <laughs> balanced way of answering the question. If I'm <laughs> um, uh, again a small sector but an interesting one and one which is attracting a lot of corporate interest at the moment I think and that's partly because at the moment such a high premium attaches to uh, 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 different forms of protein produced that way lab meat for example um, what do I say um, I, I think the fact you talked about the adverts at the end is really interesting because a colleague of mine, the David Evans I referred to, who did the food waste work, is also doing some work on alternative proteins. And the, there's this interesting thing. Are people selling alternative proteins, trying to make them as much like meat as possible? And lots of established vegetarians hate that. The last thing they want is you know, a sausage or a, a burger or whatever. That's what they're reacting against. But in the kind of transition that people are making towards more plant-based diets, it might be exactly what's needed. So I think there's a there's a really interesting transition going on where all of those things are at play. Um, it's a bit like um, 
the organic movement that Julie Guthman wrote about. And as it becomes more commercialized, is that a great thing because people are catching on and it's becoming mainstream? Or is it a terrible thing because as it gets commercialized, it's people going as low over the hurdle as they can to get the accreditation um, and not in the spirit of uh, earlier versions of that organic movement. So I, I, you know, I think the way you ask the question, you've, you've answered your own question and there is certainly a lot to be suspicious of. Uh, if you, I don't know if you know her, but Alexandra Sexton works with us in Sheffield and she's written quite a lot on, on um, uh, alternative proteins and particularly the kind of interest of venture capitalists and other financial interests in moving in that direction. So Alex Sexton would be better place to answer the question than me. Yes, and of course there is a there's a, there's a connection through there because you know part of the food speculation argument is you know what what are why are hedge funds investing in wheat you know I mean why and why are they manipulating the price of wheat across the world I mean oh, governments should really remove food from that speculation space and that might be something we could think about same kind of problem in a way but yeah I mean, Jennifer Clapp is thinking. really interestingly about food and financialization and it's absolutely in that area you've just yeah. described. Uh, let's carry carry on. We've got a few more minutes. I'm going to try and get a few more questions in from the very excitable IGP this evening. So, uh, Yu Chun Kan is saying there seems to be a growing interest in past food practices in history and archaeology, and I'm wondering in which way can these studies about the past help us face the current crisis and inequality in food? So, do you have any suggestions for research students in the humanities who could like to join this conversation? Okay, I'll have a go. Um, mm -hmm. There's a colleague of mine called Siobhan Lambert Hurley, who mm -hmm. is in the history department at Sheffield, and she has a project with Duncan Cameron, who's a soil scientist, um, and their project is called, I think it's called, I think it, it might, might not be called, it's about heritage foods. Mm -hmm. So it's about why did certain strains of rice get uh, forgotten about um, because of a more industrialized, efficient way of producing food, and what can we learn from it? And it's an arts humanities person connecting with a natural scientist and doing really exciting things. It includes uh, a literary archive, poetry, uh, performance stuff, cooking with people and all, all sorts. So it's partly about what would it take to revive those heritage seeds and can we grow them commercially, which is where the soil scientist comes in. But it's also about the whole kind of cultural significance of those foods, which are either they're either heritage or they're completely forgotten or lost. So I, I, yes, I think there's lots of really interesting stuff to be done around, I, I don't know, I don't particularly like the phrase heritage myself, but, but that notion of uh, a cultural tradition which has been eroded or, um, appropriated or all those other uh, things that happen to so-called heritage foods. Yeah, so Siobhan Lambert Hurley is her name. Okay, great. So let's go now then to the uh, lecture theatre where staff and students are watching. We have questions there and let's, uh, let, let's, let's, can we, can we focus in on you, le lecture theatre? Can we hear from someone there? Can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect, Nehra, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I know we're nearly out of time, so I'll try to be very quick. So my question is about um, uh, food-related waste, and particularly about um, all the waste that's generated by food packaging. And you know, it seems to me that there is a huge amount of plastic that's completely unnecessarily used in food packaging, and I could never really understand why it's used. You know, like why why do individual cucumbers have to be wrapped in plastic? Or why do individual heads of broccoli have to be wrapped in plastic when, you know, it, they're perfectly fine if they're not? And I could, I, I could never really wrap my mind around that. So just wondering if you could uh, share some insights on why that's the case. Okay, I can have a go at that. There's, there's a project in Sheffield which is looking about single-use plastics and alternatives to them in terms of systems of reuse. But the cucumber example is a really interesting one because our initial reaction is, this is a ridiculous waste of, of packaging, how we got to that situation. And then other people will say, no, actually the plastic packaging preserves the shelf life of the cucumber. And so is better for the environment than having it unpackaged and being damaged or, or wasted. 
So there's a really interesting, this is, I think, well, I mentioned um, life cycle analysis or life cycle assessment before. There are some really interesting things to be done in that space around food waste. Another example would be uh, plastic bags in supermarkets where there was a tax on them and they were more or less removed. People were encouraged to buy a bag for life, often a heavier duty plastic. They forgot them, left them at home in the boot of the car, so they bought another one. So the waste resource action programs done some really interesting work on you know, how many times would you need to reuse this particular kind of packaging in order to generate the savings that outweigh uh, the, the waste that might be related to them. So I think it's a really, uh, at the moment, plastic packaging has had that blue planet effect. You know, it's kind of demonized and it's worth remembering all of the benefits that plastic, all, all of the, the properties of plastic that made it popular in the first place. So I think lots of supermarkets are responding to uh, consumer demand to reduce plastic. Uh, I think only today Morrison's announced that they were not selling milk in plastic bottles anymore. They were using uh, a plant-based carbon alternative. Uh, but sometimes there's, they're being driven by a perception of what is good for the environment than what might actually be. So, you know, how many times do you have to use a paper bag uh, in order to, all, that, all those kinds of questions. So I think it's not as simple as it first looks. And I think the current demonization of plastic packaging is unhelpful. And we need to think about kind of pros and cons of why it got to be popular, what its material qualities are, and what the balance of evidence is in terms of replacing it with something else. Although I think that very soon there will be some alternative uh, new materials that will, will do that probably. I mean, I think that is one area where there is significant um, pro progress. Uh, do we have any more questions from the floor? Are you or, or in, in the lecture theatre? Or was that the last one? You're done, are you? Okay, good. Look, it's coming right up to the to the end now. So I, I think I think I'm done, Henrietta. Certainly. You're done. Are you exhausted by our questions? I'm sorry, Peter. We do tend to get a bit overexcited. Um, so we've had a wonderful thing. Um, I just wanted to, to to ask you just before we let you go whether you wanted to say anything about something you started with, but we didn't ever pick up, which was really more about the sort of circular economy and and, and the, the, the the question of of you know not only composting composting organic waste for regenerative agriculture but also the question of the waste of food in the system i mean if we actually cut down on that waste would that make a difference to um food security how how can we calculate these kinds of things yeah i'm not an expert on that but um, mm -hmm. that sapaya report i mentioned too has a whole chapter on circular economy mm -hmm. and waste was the example and it yes. was written by a guy called Pierre, Pierre Giuseppe Morone. Yeah. Uh, so there is, there is, that's a good place to look. Okay. But the, lo the logic of your question is right, isn't it? If there was a more circular economy, if we reduced food waste, that is very likely to reduce food insecurity. Yeah, exactly. But part of the, the geography in me would say, you know, where is this happening and what are the social dynamics of it, if you like, the inequality. I know, always good questions from geographers in my experience. So good, good, good. So thank you for a wonderful uh, talk. We've enjoyed ourselves hugely. I'm sorry we've e e exhausted you. No, no, we no, were... exhausted in a good way. I think there are very nice questions and I think what you're doing in the Institute is, is excellent. Oh, thank you very much. Well, we're very, very happy with that. So we've got people on the panel. So let's just give you a round of applause, even though you're not there. So put your 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 things on panel. <laughs> so there we go. Thank you very much indeed. Lovely, Peter. Hope to see you soon in person. Yeah. That will be nice. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, thank I'm you jealous very of the big in the lecture theatre. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. Me too. <laughs> see. Thank you again.